Anyway, so what I want to talk to you about today is um, Click and the whole context in which we developed Click so that you can see the reasons why we've been doing this. So basically, the talk for today has got these three parts. So I want to look at the state of play, especially from a corpus linguistic point of view, because I'm a corpus linguist and I'm very interested in trying to tell other corpus linguists that they should not be just speaking amongst themselves, but also with lots of other people. Then I want to do a bit of outward-looking corpus linguistics, so what else is around there in related fields, especially digital humanities, where we need to have more dialogue. And then I want to show you some ways of how you can use our web application so that we can then potentially reconceptualize the way corpus linguists approach the study of literature. So, can I just see, can you put up your hand anyone who would self-identify as a corpus linguist in this room, just so that I get a sense of who might be, oh, that is a good, uh, we have two, three, maybe three, good. So I'm glad I've got this slide here. So for all those people who haven't put up their hand, corpus linguistics is a field of study where people work with corpora. So I've given you the, you know, so that you don't confuse corpus and other things. Um, a corpus is usually a large collection of samples of naturally occurring language. And the important bit is that it's stored in computer-readable formats so that you can do something with it. What corpus linguistics is very good at is providing you with methods so that you can find linguistic patterns, regularities, things that are repeated. Okay? What corpus linguists then have been doing is they've done a lot of work in lexicography, in grammar, English language teaching, discourse analysis, historical linguistics, translation, so it's basically the list continues. Anything where the study of language is relevant is something that we as corpus linguists are massively interested in. Okay, so the state of play as far as fiction in corpora is concerned. While we had something that people like to call the corpus revolution in the sense of things have changed, the world of linguistics has kind of changed since we have been paying attention to frequency and repeated patterns. However, the way we've dealt with literature in corpora has been lagging behind quite a bit. So John Sinclair said at some point, um, a literary text is just not worth including in a corpus because it will disappear below the waves. If you find something that just occurs once in Jane Austen, that is very unlikely to be a good candidate to make it into a dictionary where you want to say, what is the language like? So you don't want to have idiosyncratic examples, but you want to see mainstream, big pictures, and therefore literary texts really haven't received much <coughs> attention. Also, the issue of copyright has come in, because if you want to do a corpus where you have things like, I don't know, Fifty Shades of Grey or something like this in your corpus, you wouldn't be able to do this easily, because they're copyright issues. Yeah? I know that some people have done some work on Harry Potter, and I wonder how they've done this. Anyway, so there are copyright issues that you need to take into account. Also, if you like, like me, like Dickens a lot, this raises questions about balance. You know, if you include five novels by Charles Dickens in your corpus, your corpus is already quite skewed, because Charles Dickens wrote a lot longer texts than, for instance, Ian Fleming, when you look at Bond novels, I've been doing a bit of work on James Bond as well, and there you have got very, very short novels and not much that you can find in terms of repeated patterns. Anyway, so what corpus linguists have done is they tended to look at fiction mainly as a register. So if you know the work by Doug Biber, that has shown us very much how different registers are differentiated by the features that are in them. And then fiction usually is used to say, We've got academic writing, we've got newspaper articles, we've got spoken conversation, and we've got fiction. How are all these different? Okay, so you're not really interested in these are fictional texts with their own textual worlds, but you really just have a data set that shows you how this data set is different from conversation or is different from academic writing. And so people haven't really paid much attention to what makes fictional texts. So the focus also was, and that connects with something that we saw yesterday in the workshop, 
about the lexical based approach. It really has focused a lot on the word and the context of words. So lexical grammar has been significantly revised through corpus linguistics, but then textual features. As soon as you start looking at things like cohesion or meanings that are really specific to one particular text, then you start to struggle as a corpus linguist. Okay, so there is then an area of corpus linguistics where people started themselves um, uh, started to call themselves corpus stylisticians, and um, I'm probably guilty of that as well. So people there used corpus linguistic methods to then study fictional texts. So they wanted to give more room to this qualitative aspect of studying fiction. And an important aspect there is to say the text is really the unit of meaning. In a fictional text, meanings are very particular to that one text. A lot is shared, but you always have your one textual fictional world that you need to deal with. And an approach that has become really popular in this um, is what Bill Lowe has called matching texts against corpora. So I'll do this example very, very quickly because I hope lots of you have seen this, maybe. Has anyone seen uh, Bill Lowe's analysis of Larkin's days? Can you just put up your hand because then it's no, no one? Okay, so what Bill Lowe does, he looks at this poem, and then if you just read this quickly, you will see this isn't exactly a happy poem. Yeah? So, and you, you see that it isn't particularly happy because you've got here brings the priest and the doctor running over the field, and if those two guys are visiting you together, you know you're in trouble. Okay? So that tells you that it isn't a particularly nice, happy poem. And Bill tries to argue and says, we can already see this sense of almost gloominess in the first stanza when we have this here, days are where. And he argues that this pattern, days are, followed by where, is quite unusual. So he says, a way of finding out what's happening here is we take what is in this poem and see what we can find in large corpora to get a sense of why do we read this poem in this particular way. So here's an example that isn't exactly the data he took, but I just got this from the British National Corpus and the results are exactly the same. If you run a concordance for days are, is the term concordance, is that something you're familiar with? So concordance is a display format and you look at the node word or phrase centered with some context on the left and some on the right and then you look for the patterns. If you look at this quickly, you will see that things that are repeated after days are are things like gone, numbered, and over. Okay? So what Lowe then says is, if you, have, if you basically have this background knowledge being exposed to the language where you know that when you talk about days are, they are numbered and over and it's all very bad and gloomy, you bring this to reading this poem and in the first stanza you're already being set up to read it in a way that then goes together nicely with the second one. And he calls that matching texts against corpora. And you can do this with poetry, and he's also shown how you can do this with parts of novels. So that is something that people in corpus stylistics got very fond of. Okay. If I'm too fast, and if there's anything you don't understand, can you tell me while I'm speaking, rather than letting it all pass, and then in the end say, that was really useless because I didn't understand a word. So yeah, is that OK? <laughs> Good. So um, we had this. OK, standard tools that people have been using is things like Wordsmith and Unkong. Some of them we heard about yesterday, stuff like W Matrix, BNC Web, the BYU um, Corpora. People very rarely do more sophisticated stuff like MD analysis, which is partly to do with you need to get hold of the tagger. But luckily, um, Andrea Nini has now made a tagger available, so you can actually easily do MD analysis now if you want to. Uh, multi-dimensional analysis, so basically the Bible 1988 stuff um, made available for other people. My question in all of this is, have we really gone far enough? So is it enough if we as corpus linguists say, okay, you know I can do corpus linguistics, so I might as well look at literary texts and then find out something useful as well. And you see this is quite a leading question, isn't it? Have we done enough? Obviously we haven't. So um, we need to look at... Um, Oops, oh, I'm giving it all away. Some fundamental, some fundamental stuff. So this is the Spitzer circle that some of you might be aware of. So Spitzer, very early on in the 20th century, has said, if we look at any kind of literary text, we can look at this 
in two ways. So we can say this novel is a work of art and then you can talk about the literary effect. So you can talk about it in terms of literary appreciation. And then you can go and say, okay, if I feel like this when I read Bleak House, is there any evidence in the text that I might be able to connect to my reading of Bleak House? So you go from here to the linguistic description. You can also say any novel is just a sample of language. Okay? So you could say Bleak House, very strange opening chapter. You have all these non-finite ver verbs, very strange uh, constructions. Linguistically, there is something odd about this. So what is the, am I allowed to at least stand up? What is the <laughs> literary <laughs> effect of this, okay? So, and then I suggested at some point, maybe we need to add a little box in here because now that corpus linguistics have done, has done so much to change the categories that we use to describe language. So we've really seriously questioned, is the word the unit of meaning? Do we need other things? Do we need things like lexical bundles, lexical grammatical things? Should we talk about patterns? All of this. So how would this affect how we talk about literature? Okay. So what people have started to do is to think about corpus linguistics in terms of um, what can it do to, to help us find effects of foregrounding. So foregrounding really is a psychological effect. Foregrounding is something that happens in your head as a reaction to what you're reading. But there's a link between what is foregrounded and what you can see in the text as a potential deviation from a norm. Okay? So people have done these things like I showed you with uh, the Bill Lowe example for comparing the meaning in a text extract to a general corpus. Or people have looked at keywords in Romeo and Juliet compared to Shakespeare's other plays to see is there anything that makes that play different from the others. Or people have looked at what happens in early Dickens compared to late Dickens. How is Dickens similar or different from Wilkie Collins? And you see how that is also very similar to what has happened in stylometry. Because the idea of norms is something that is very important in concepts of style and stylometry. Question is, do, does this really play to the strengths of corpus linguistics in terms of finding patterns? Because corpus linguistics is very good at finding frequent phenomena that are difficult to notice. So, I wanted to suggest to also add another box and say, maybe because our linguistics description has changed and we have got these corpus linguistic things now coming in, we also need to consider a little bit more what is the relationship between these new categories and what we find in literary texts, but also if we read literature, are there potentially categories that we haven't thought about as linguists yet? And do we need those because we get them from patterns in lots of fiction? Yeah? And only because we haven't looked, we shouldn't just assume there isn't anything interesting. Anyway, so now a few things on the outward looking corpus linguistics. Can we do a little poll or so, so, so that I can see, because I, I tend to do this slide at conferences a lot and it's so revealing. Could you put up your hand if you heard about culturonomics? Anyone heard about culturonomics? Two people, three people. Cultural analytics takers, yeah, same people. Distant reading, yes, that's getting better. Linked reading, anyone? No? Oh, okay. Surface reading, good, good. Macro analysis, yeah. And the list, you could continue the list endlessly. And I spent, you know, I spent a couple of days just trying to really check the references to see what do people do and how is what this person says very similar to what that person says. And funnily enough, how do they never cite each other if they're not working together in the same group, although they're looking at very similar things. This, this is good fun, so if you have a Saturday afternoon to do this, I can strongly recommend this. The interesting bit is if, if you go to corpus linguistics conferences, most people haven't come across any of these terms, which I find slightly worrying. But also if you speak to people who would self-identify as these people in culturonomics or cultural analytics, very often they have heard very little of corpus linguistics. And since we are talking about bridging gaps, I think there is a massive gap that we really need to start to bridge. And you can see links between the two very, very easily. So this is one of the famous Moretti quotes on uh, how c uh, distance really is a condition of knowledge and how you then can actually lose the text itself. 
And that links up nicely with what John Sinclair said in the 1990s about the language looks rather different when you look at a lot at once. Only it seems that, you know, in the distant reading, people take the distance from the literary text. In corpus linguistics, people take the more distant perspective from stuff that you want to know about in terms of the language. Okay? And I think if we would bring these things together a little bit more, we could avoid articles like this one. I don't know whether anyone has read this, but that is quite a damning article on how digital humanity is really just pointless and wasting a lot of government money, and so we shouldn't be doing it. And I felt, you know, if, if we were better able to articulate what we're doing, this shouldn't happen. Anyway, so now on to an example of how I want to show you how we can do something about bridging these gaps. My example today is on using corpus linguistics to rethink <laughs> approaches to speech in fiction. And I first need to explain a little bit why that might be an interesting question. So... Um, in literary stylistics, is that, that a field? Are, are people happy with literary stylistics? Have we got anyone who works in that area? One person, two, three, four. Yeah, it's so nice to have such a mixed group. This is fantastic. So there are a couple of people who would feel very familiar with the approaches in literary stylistics. And there, Norman Page in the 1980s wrote a book on um, speech in the English novel, which is really still one of the main reference works if you want to look at speech. And he makes some really important points there where he says there's really an inevitable gap between what we think speech in fiction is and what real spoken language is. And for him, the difference is mainly due to the fact that we have a difference in medium. So spoken versus written, even if we represent spoken and write it down, it isn't spoken anymore, it is something else. Also in fiction, the context of situation that is so immensely important for spoken language and pragmatics is the whole area that deals with it. What do you do with this in fiction? Because imagine how boring a novel would be if you had to describe the whole context in which something happens to then make sure that all the pointing that is going on would work. So you just can't do it. You need to find other ways. Also, you don't do phonological uh, representations of the language. You know, some people say Dickens is so good at representing this and this accent. He absolutely isn't. I mean, what he represents isn't the accent. What he does is write in a way that he suggests it is a particular accent, but it isn't exactly a representation of the accent. So there are literary standards of dealing with things in speech in a particular way. Um, so he basically argues, or, or I think what people in literary stylistics have then done and I know this because I sometimes got reviews from submitting journal articles where people then say, this is pointless looking at speech and fiction. You know, since the 80s, we know that this isn't a research question because Page has shown it's so different, so why do you even go there? Okay. Um, uh, the way people have looked at speech and fiction is very much through this, the speech thought and writing representation model by Leach and Short, where they were mainly interested in something direct speech uh, free um, direct speech, free indirect speech. But funnily enough, this whole approach deals with how speech is embedded in the novel, but it doesn't deal with the content of the speech. So it says there's a reporting clause, and therefore it's this, this, and the other. But it doesn't really look at what do these fictional characters actually say, and is this like spoken language or not. So it's more dealing with how do I do something that looks like spoken and make this possible for the narrative. So what we have done in our click project is um, something extremely simple, so I wonder why no one really has done this to the extent, but sometimes it's the simple stuff that you need to... We marked up everything that is within quotation marks, so the, the red stuff is everything within quotation marks, and we just call this quotes, and everything outside of quotation marks we call this non-quotes. So very non-theoretical, not associated with a particular framework, just, just entirely going on punctuation. Okay? <coughs> now that we've got that, we can use corpus linguistics methods in a bit of a different way. So instead of taking every Dickens text as a whole, we can now say we just want to look at what is within quotation marks and what is outside of quotation marks and see what kind of patterns you get in this way. So, since corpus work is to a large extent really comparison, again, connecting to what we heard yesterday, if you just look at your one little thing, 
that isn't good enough. You need to see how does this relate to other stuff around it. You could then compare speech in Dickens's novels to the BNC spoken. Okay, and here come my reviewers again. If I do something like this, people say, yeah, but Dickens, you know, this is 19th century, the BNC, this is too late. Obviously, this is different. Why don't you use a spoken corpus of Victorian speech? And you think, yeah, I would love to, but uh, no one in, you know, at Victorian times remembered to compile a spoken corpus for me, so I don't have anything else. So, th so that is also something we need to think about, that you need to live with what you've got, okay? There's also another argument that is a bit less um, to deal with re reviewers and they say, but we also argue that you can use the BNC or now the BNC, the new one, the 2014 that will be released later this year to say, this is a proxy of the linguistic knowledge of readers of today. Because it doesn't help if we know how people spoke in Victorian times if we read the books today. Because the knowledge that we bring to Little Dorrit is the knowledge that we have of present day language. So if something sounds odd to us, that is because it sounds odd in relation to today's standards. But it might not have sounded odd at the time. So there's also a reason for why you could do this. The way we do this comparison is um, making connections to what Biber and his colleagues have done in the study of lexical bundles. So lexical bundles are basically engrams, but in the sense that they have to be the very, very, very frequent engrams. So not any engram, but something that meets a cutoff of, say, 20 per million or 40 per million, depending on the length of the engram. And here again, here comes the stuff that then rules out fiction most of the time. They need to be really dispersed, so they need to be in at least five texts. So if the engrams all occur just in Oliver Twist, you would chuck them out in a description of the language in general. Engrams are very important when we describe the speaker-listener world, okay, because this has something to do with processing. So this idea of <coughs> while we speak, we don't piece all the words together, but we've got knowledge of the language, so we've got these longer sequences that we can draw on. And you can see differences, especially in language learning, when um, your students start to sound more native-like, when they actually pick up these sequences rather than trying to put everything together themselves. So, um, and I've talked about some of these things already. What you can then see is, if you compare what happens in Dickens and in the BNC, you can find quite a bit of overlap. So here's an example of one of these lexical bundles. What do you think of? And this here is Nicholas Nickleby, and this is the BNC. And if you compare this, you see A, they occur in the same text and they also function pretty similar, which is quite an interesting finding. You can also look at um, B and C lexical bundles that only occur once in the whole corpus of Dickens' speech. And, and this is where I find it becomes interesting, because if you just do the I look at literature only approach, you will never find these things because you just can't be bothered. I mean, if you look at everything that occurs once, you'll never get to the end of it. However, if you start the other way around and say, I want to see what are the typical speech lexical bundles in the British National Corpus, so today's spoken language, and then you just try and find them in Dickens, you can find things that may just occur once in Dickens, but they will sound speech-like or natural to you because this is what you've been exposed to as a speaker of the language. Okay, and then you have things like here, um, go and have a look. Okay, this is Barnaby Rudge, and that is one of the spoken uh, lexical bundles in the BNC, and you also got this in Barnaby Rudge. So that might be, uh, might be something that contributes to why Dickens sounds to readers occasionally quite spoken-like. Might be, you know. What we've then been doing is we've, we've or oh, we're still doing this, uh, we're doing lots of comparisons. So we've got the BNC, we've got Dickens, we've got a reference corpus of other 19th century fiction. Chillet, that is one we just started on, so we're also looking at children's fiction, so especially 19th century children's fiction, so the classics in terms of thinking about how does that have an impact on how children would, would have read or stuff like this. And then you can do what Bill Lowe does with his matching texts against corpora. You can do this a, a little bit differently. So here on the left, we've got 
uh, clusters or lexical bundles, however you want to call them now, in great expectations. And these are the frequencies in great expectations. And you see how this is really not very interesting. You know, once, twice, three times. You, you usually wouldn't go there. But you can then do this and say, I want to see if there are so if there are a lexical bundles in Dickens' novels and in the spoken B and C, I then match them to see what I get. So you get these that are occurring repeatedly, but you also get these that just occur once. And especially things with don't know are very spoken-like, because in speech we say a lot, I don't know. That is just something we say it so often we don't even realize how little we know that we say it. Okay? So, um, and that is also relevant to fiction. Then we looked at word bundles that are shared between all four corpora, so they occur in the BNC in 19th century in Dickens and children's literature, and then you see they sound pretty spoken-like, don't they? I think it would be, what do you think of, are you going to do, what are you going to, blah, blah, blah. You know, these are quite spoken elements. Um, almost a bit more exciting is then this. If you have got... Um, lexical bundles that do not occur in the BNC, but that are shared across all the other three corpora of the 19th century. So things like, I beg your pardon, sir, very much obliged to you, I'm glad to be so good as to. What is this, if you look at this? Do you, do you see what, what kind of stuff that is? It's kind of, it's phrasal politeness, isn't it? And you can see that if you look at language change, things like politeness, they are quite dependent on, you know, the time they are used. So the way you apologize, the way you thank people, the way you say hi to people, all this, you know, the in-group things that are important, that, uh, these are quite, um, you know, they are subject to historical change probably a bit more quickly than other things. So that then can give you an indication of what people at the time probably have heard, okay? just by the fact that they are shared so much. Okay, so our approach to fictional speech bundles is one where we say, okay, these bundles can be very specific to individual text or authors, but the point I really like to make is you need to be careful that you don't claim, when you study Dickens, you don't claim that everything is Dickensian. While Dickens has a lot of stuff that is Dickensian, Dickens also has a lot of stuff that is not only Dickens, only because most people tend not to look beyond anything else than Dickens. And again, I usually have a field day when I look at some literature to see where people make these claims and say, in Nicholas Nickleby you have got this little face and this, this is Dickens at his best. And then I go and check in the corpse and say, no, he isn't. It is actually also here, here, there, and you know. But, but you need to be able to do these comparisons and are happy to say understanding what's going on is also comparison to a large extent. There will still be things that are completely Dickensian in the sense of he uses a particular phrase to make a character very individual. So, but there is this decline, you know, some things are very specific and some things are very general and there is a lot in between and the in between is what I'm particularly interested in. Okay, so there's then this overlap with these lexical bundles of real spoken language, the, the things that are shared across the text. And in fiction, you can also create meaning, obviously, by contrast. So you can look at, if you do a key comparison, so um, like keywords only with clusters, you can then check which of these sequences or these bundles are actually significantly more frequently in quotes versus non-quotes. So you have things like, what do you mean, or I beg your pardon, that come out as statistically significantly more frequent in quotes if you compare quotes against non-quotes. And so you get this meaning by contrast as well. Um, particularly exciting is then if you look at the textual effects of this contrast, because you can now measure lexical bundles or engrams or however you want to call them and say, if the corpus tells me that this list here is something that tends to occur in, let's say, 95% of the cases within quotes, it is then highly exciting to check what happens in these 5% of the cases where it occurs in non-quotes. And um, here's an example from Bleak House. 
where you have uh, s uh, um, s a little bit of passage, and then Sir Leicester is majestically lost. Alumnia never heard of such a thing, and blah, blah, blah. So of such a thing is a phrase that tends to occur within quotation marks. And if you then have it in what looks like narration, you get interesting bits for free indirect discourse. And you can then see what happens. How does the narrator actually get into the head of the characters by using what they might or might not have said? And um, uh, this free indirect discourse or free indirect speech is a, is, is a notoriously difficult topic. And people have tried all sorts of things to make this uh, automatic detection. And I think this could be one element. This doesn't solve it. But this is another thing that you could add to the list of things that you could check automatically. So um, um, for the last couple of slides, what I want to do is talk about speech in context. Um, because, and this is also, I think that is, you know, so, sorry, sorry, I just need to keep making fun of this sitting down situation. Because you can see, I just can't do it. I so can't do it. Um, <laughs> Speech in context is also very much about body language, and some people need it more than others. So um, it's when you speak, usually body language happens at the same time. And that makes it very, very difficult to deal with in fiction, because how texts are linear. You can't do things at the same time. You can't put a line under the text to say, and while this is happening, you also have this happening in terms of body language. So you need to think about how do you textually present body language, and that's something I'm quite interested in. Also, amazingly, we don't speak much about body language, okay? Un unless we are in a situation like this where it becomes challenging, then you talk about it all the time. But under normal circumstances, if anyone gives you a talk, you wouldn't talk about the person's body language, you know, uh, saying, oh, this weird thing she did with her hair or something like this, because that would be distinctly rude, wouldn't it? So, you know, you could see these things, but you don't pick them up, okay? So that is also why if you look at the BNC, so a general corpus, you find very little textual evidence on body language. And even in psychology, people are looking, to some extent, at literary texts to get insights into how body language works. So that is an area where we like to look at. And it's very much, obviously, situated in the cultural and historical context, because things change, and not least because people wear different clothes. You know, if, if all the women wear long dresses and you know, all sorts of other uncomfortable things, then body language is quite different from what you see if you can just you know, rock up in your jeans and give a presentation. Yeah? So um, what I want to show you is, um, what we have been doing with the Click web application. And I must say, now, normally I say to people, try it while I speak, use it on your iPhone, it all works brilliantly. And this is so, today, for some reason, the university has decided to do some update to the server. So at this particular moment in time, we can't get into the server. I hope they fix it by the end of my talk so that you can then get back in. Usually, this web app is entirely free, works on all sorts of devices, if you like. And what we've done there is put these corpora in and the various uh, text passages. And I just want to show you some things now. I've spent a lot of time looking at sequences like this, like his hands in his pockets, so these engrams where you don't have any interruptions. And what we wanted to do with Click is create a, um, yeah, a tool that isn't as sophisticated as the, you know, the high-end statistical stuff. So it's really for people to use when they are interested in how can I do a bit more than close reading, how can I do some corpus linguistic stuff, but not with all the difficulties in, in it. So, so we then created something that we call the quick grouper. So and luckily I've screenshotted this now. So, so you can look at, um, you can put in all Dickens's novels, you can put in the word hands, and then you get a concordance like this, where you can then also have here in our little quick grouper, you can then see, if I look at my concordance, there might be words that are repeated, and if you put them in that box here, you group them all together, okay, so that you can then uh, play around with your patterns. You can then use the little slider to say, I only want to see that position, or I just want to see the stuff on the right. That is the very basic stuff. We also have annotated in click what we call suspension. So if you look here, 
um, you are so kind, Lucretia, returned Mrs. Chick a little softened. So you have a character speaks, and then you have the narrator coming in with a bit of information, and then the speech continues. And that links to what I was saying about the how do I represent something that is meant to be happening simultaneously. Yeah? This is a very good place where the narrator can slip in stuff that almost looks as if it's happening at the same time, because it would sound very different if we had, um, uh, you are so kind, and then Miss Chick speaks, and then Miss, Ch uh, Miss Chick became a little softened or something like this. Then you really make a point of it, you know, if you put it in a separate sentence. But if you slip it in like this, um, that works um, in a different way. And then what you can do with click is, you can then run concordances, not just for the whole text, but just for suspension. So you just want to find these little places. So here this is in Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth, where you can then see um, set Elizabeth though burning with curiosity or set Elizabeth coloring with astonishment, blah, blah, blah. So you can then zoom into places where you can find particularly interesting stuff in terms of what is happening while the people speak. And you might say, oh, this is just a well-chosen example, you know, if I check anything else, nothing will come up. It does. And you find quite different things. So this is Mrs. Sparsett in Hard Times. And if you compare that woman to the women in Pride and Prejudice, you will see how these parts within the speech are really rather different because she isn't described in nice terms at all. And there isn't that much emotion, but there's just pompous and lofty behavior that is being drawn attention to. Okay, I don't have the time to show you our recent distribution plot or the chapter view or any of this. So, um, but what we've also done is uh, we've created um, a little thing that helps you to define annotation yourself. So if you go through concordance lines and have here hat in suspensions, for instance, and then you want to annotate them in terms of different body language patterns, you can open a little box where you create your own tags, and then these are just things I've made up, and then you see them appearing here with these little ticks, and if you then highlight a concordance line, you can add a tick to this, okay? So that is basically a way of helping you while you do the concordance analysis so that you don't lose what you were thinking about, and then you can also obviously easily count this up. You can export this into an Excel sheet, and now you would say, but this is a web application. If I spend my whole day doing this, and then the server crashes like today, and all my work is entirely lost, and I can't come back to this tomorrow, you can export this as an Excel sheet, and when you come back, you just load it back in, and you continue what you've been doing, and you can also, and that is fun if you do teaching in the classroom, you can have different people do this, and then we've got this merge button, and then you can merge them together, and then in your classroom you can see how many of you do agree on the annotation of that line, and then you can see what you've got, and or do inter-rater reliability for other things, if you wish. Anyway, so I've got a few more minutes, haven't I, to show you some other interesting things that, that is completely work in progress now. But we also looked at what do we do, um, what do we make of the cumul cumulative picture of looking at lots of body language? You know, is it all individual instances or do we get anything out of it? So we found that if you annotate, and we've done this by hand with two other colleagues, and they really weren't very happy with me at the end of this when we spent days looking at suspensions, but then the results were nice, so that's good. You then get these patterns that you have... Um, a reporting verb, a body part noun, an ING form, and then we said this is descriptive, shaking his head because there is no other explanation. And then you have something like shaking his head pleasantly, we could say there's an interpretation going on with it because the narrator tries to push you into a certain way of looking at this person. And we wanted to combine this now with collocation, so the study of collocation, because our question is what are the collocations of all the body part nouns in these different fictional texts. And the way collocations have been looked at before is here's Wordsmith, for instance, someone then says you need to do an MI test or a T score, Z score, or dice, or whatever kind of score you want to do, and then you see how significant these collocations are. What is the problem then is how you, I need to skip over this, yeah, I'll do this quickly, how you actually then compare collocations across corpora. So if you say, I've got 19th century collocations of eyes or head or hands here, and I've got them in Dickens here, how do I know that there is some kind of 
relationship between them other than looking at these different tables and then matching them up in some way. So what we have done is, this is a little R program that you can download from our GitHub if you want to. So uh, this is here on the GitHub, it's the Corpora Coco if you want to look at this. And these are the people who are involved in it. So what we've done with this is we look at node collocate pairs. Yeah? So where you say you've got the word head and you have words like his or again or something like this. And then for each of these pairs, you count the hits and misses. So you see how often do they actually go together or how often do they not go together if you look at the slots in the concordance lines where they could have had them. And then the way we measure is uh, we measure this co-occurrence in terms of how big the difference is with effect size but across, across the corpora. And then we show this with um, for plots like this. So you have here at the bottom this is head in Dickens, and you have things like here these verbs again. You've got shaking, nodding, returned, whereas above, with the 19th century, you tend to have things like your know, names, character names, seem to be more significantly collocating with head. Interesting is then things like this come up. You have got head returned. So is this his head returned or? We don't know what that is. Or eyes. Is that her eyes returned to something? And funnily enough, there are here some other verbs that returned. So the, so the purple is the, the collocation in, in Dickens. You have got head and hands and eyes, words like this. And these are actually these patterns we looked at before. So what you get is you've got a reporting verb. You've got a body part now and then something else around it. So you can actually look at these patterns as a reflection of the collocational behavior of body part nouns. This is interesting from a theoretical point of view as well, because in corpus linguistics, because we had this drive to look at lexical patterns, we have lots of very useful descriptions of the verb something, something in corpus so and so, and then lots of stuff on this. Uh, and, but we have not really looked at how do words group together into areas of meaning. This is sometimes done by semantic annotation, but then the annotation comes from a dictionary that adds your view of the world to what you find in the corpus. Our argument is, yes, um, that you can also do this bottom up by looking at the collocation in the corpus and then coming up with areas of meaning that you describe in this particular way. So again, it's the making links that we are interested in to really do things. So, and, I, and I realize and I'll need to like get to the pushing the boundaries quickly. So I'll just summarize this very quickly. So what I want to say as bringing this all together is corpus linguistics is extremely good when we use it to compare things. And so rather than trying to do stuff with corpus linguistics that it isn't good at, why don't we focus on the things we can do and then say for the other things, we just can't do it. It is fine. You don't have to do everything with every method. I strongly believe that really multi-method is the only way to go to do something decent. So we need to focus on what is it we are good at. If we do this, we also need to rethink quite a lot of things that we have become very used to. So these cutoff points in the discussion of lexical bundles are very much a view of just looking at a particular register. We need to reconsider what we mean by texts. Do we just compare a text against other texts, or do we say within a text, especially fiction, there's different things within quotation marks, outside of quotation marks. We all know that the beginning of a novel is different from the end of the novel, but there's also stuff within the text. Normally, I do all the theoretical stuff at the beginning, but then I would have needed two hours. So this connects to the work that I'm doing with Peter Stockwell on um, um, things around mind modeling, theory of mind stuff, how does characterization work. Um, we do some work with um, eye tracking as complementary evidence to say if you find all that stuff in the corpus, how do people actually read this if you put them in front of a screen and see what the eye movement is? Do they spot anything that I find interesting when I look at the corpus? Or if they read this, do they really not pay any attention to it? And importantly, we really need to work on the relationship with other 
disciplines, not only literary stylistics, Victorianist literary studies, but also really talk more within digital humanities so that we don't all just make up our own term, but really try to speak across. Just two slides to show you in case you want to get involved. We are now, um, we've now got this blog where people try out exciting stuff. So these blog posts are not written by us. So we only just give people the platform to do this. So they are showing ways of doing things with literary texts where other people can then get inspiration from. And here are just some references. And if you want to, we've got an activity book for using Click that you can download for free. So if you ever find yourself having to teach something and don't want to prepare much, you can just basically take the handouts and the instructions and go in the classroom. And, uh, good. and if you want to email us, we can put you on the mailing list. And I'm just putting this up because this well, last month in the May issue, we were in Babel as the pullout post, and I was just so proud of this. So I needed to have this. Anyway, thank you. Exactly nine. Exactly eight. Exactly nine.